It's a um, great joy to be serving as part of the elders at uh, Discovery Church, and it's a privilege to be here uh, and sharing with you today as well. Um, welcome to everybody. My name is Paul, uh, and uh, uh, welcome to those of you who are online as well. It's great to have you with us. So I wonder if there's anyone in the room today who was here when we built this building. If there is, could you please stand? You might have been five weeks old, five years old, 50 years old. If you're involved, you were here at the time of the building. Look around. Look around. Yes, let's applaud these people. Don't sit down. The rest of us, we are living in the legacy that these folks have given to us, along with a lot of others along with some of the neighbours who came along, not too sure about the Jesus stuff, but came along and helped day and night on long weekends as well to ensure that this facility was here as a place for mission and ministry, to welcome people, uh, everybody, uh, into the heart of Jesus. Um, what a great thing, thank you. But if you've been here uh, just um, 15 years or 10 years or five years or five months or five weeks or maybe even five minutes, could you also please stand? <laughs> if the future of the people of God was in that earlier group that stood up, the future of the people of God is within each one of you because Holy Spirit is within the people of God. The future of Discovery Church is in each one of you because Holy Spirit is within each one of you. The future of Discovery Church is in you, is in you, is in you, in you, and you, all the way up there. Sorry if you're online, I am still alive. And it's in you, and in you. The future of Discovery Church is within each one of us because Holy Spirit is within each one of us. How good is that? How good is that? Are you a part of that? Is it all in? It was all in back all those years ago. You can take a seat, that's okay. It was all in all those years ago when people came together and built uh, it was all in the spirit of um, Ezra. This is the one line in the message today that's got a mention about ne Ezra, by the way. Come along next week uh, for a little bit more uh, to hear a little bit more about uh, that. Uh, but God's people and some uh, equally uninterested, possibly, uh, or unexpected neighbours came and rebuilt the temple uh, in Jerusalem. And so we are living in the legacy of all those who have gone before us, but now we are in the place of writing the legacy for the next generation, but not just the next generation. Not just the ones who are young here in this room, but their children and their grandchildren also. We're in this process, the rest of us, all of us together. The future of the people of God is within the people of God, in each one of us. All those who've gone before and some unexpected neighbours too in this period of time. The story that God is writing in us uh, and in our neighbourhood in these days is the legacy that we will gift to the future. To prayerfully discern the shape of this legacy is our task in the Legacy Project. To imagine and grasp the future, um, sometimes decisions of uh, great consequence must be named and engaged. Uh, resolving them will depend a lot on our shared capacity to acknowledge and even welcome an unravelling. Change, struggle, and to respond by seeking wisely and prayerfully discerned outcomes together. And so we take a next step in a community discernment and conversation journey. Since the first decades of the, the Christian church, open conversation and prayerful discernment have been common practices. You can read about one uh, in Acts chapter 15. I think I do need to stand up again. You don't have to. But in Acts 15, uh, there was this conversation about uh, what it really and truly meant to be a follower of Jesus and how much of past ways of doing things needed to be applied to it. And echoing the apostles in Acts, as elders, we are committed to cultivating an environment 
where the missional imagination of God is released, or maybe we could even say is unleashed. We know that this, and we are confident that this happens best in prayerful and courageous conversation, which always includes talking and listening. Talking and listening. We believe in Christianity's dangerous idea that mission and ministry and also discerning the future is in the hands and the hearts of people. All of us. It's in the wisdom of the crowd. It's of listening people into free speech. It's of conversations that are encircled with spirit-infused prayer, which, as Walter Wink says, believes the future into being. For then we will be able to say together, it seemed good to us and the Holy Spirit that we should move in this direction. The future of the people of God is contained within the people of God because Holy Spirit is within the people of God. The blueprint, if you will, for this legacy project, this time of conversation and discernment uh, that will be shaping our future mission includes these things, spiritual formation, obviously, discipleship. The next slide, thank you guys. Spiritual formation or discipleship, a process of being formed in the image of Christ for the sake of others. In the image of Christ for the sake of others. The notion that it'll always be community first and church second. It's a project that will be shaped by mission, not a building. By what our community neighbours need, 24-7, 365, and not simply what we need for Sunday. It'll be a prayer. We'll be praying a prayer that we, we, we would be indifferent to everything but the will of God, indifferent to matters of ego and prestige and organisational politics and personal advantage and personal comfort or favour or even our own pet projects or our own pet people. This is a choice to surrender fully to God. It will also include the maintenance of a, a high trust environment, an atmosphere of robust yet humble, respectful dialogue where a variety of thought is sought and celebrated all at the same time and where no idea or dream is too crazy to put out there. No idea or dream is too crazy to put out there. It's all in. It's all in. We're all in. The future of the people of God is contained within the people of God because the Holy Spirit is within the people of God. The future of discovery is in the people of discovery because Holy Spirit is in the people of discovery. Are we in? Are we in for the conversation? Are we in to listen to what the Holy Spirit is saying to us? Are we in to take some crazy steps? Just like those ones they took all those years ago that we applauded a moment ago? Are we ready? Are we in? Hello? Are we in? Are we in? Yeah, I'm sensing that we're in. Why don't we just take a moment or so just to turn to a person alongside of you, a reasonably friendly stranger or a reasonably strange friend. Or if you don't like, if you've really had a little bit too much to talk with the person next to you, husbands, wives, careful, maybe turn around to someone behind you in front of you. What's one of the things that you really appreciate about Discovery Church? Just share a sentence, not a sermon. <laughs> Just a word or a sentence. What do you really appreciate about Discovery Church? Turn, talk, listen. I'm thinking there's a few sermons. Okay, everybody. 
Hello, hello. Come back in. I'm, I'm sensing we're all in. What do you think? How good's that? You can talk in church and listen. All right. How are we going? We all good? Oh, I thought Phil would be in the middle. Oh, you don't have to be. We don't really, we don't really want you to just be a fill in. There had to be one dead joke. So, Elder Beck. Hello. Because there are two Becks. How long have the themes of the Legacy Project been on the agenda? So it's just something new or what's been, you know, what's been happening? It's definitely not something new. So this is something um, that's been stirring and, and brewing for a while now. So um, going back about four or five years ago, as um, a church, we were really in a period of um, discernment about what the future of discovery looked like and also clarification around um, the mission and, and our calling and purpose as a church. And that really involved the ability to look back and look at the history here and what was in the ground, what was in the DNA here. And as we did that, um, we started listening and becoming curious about the whisperings and the stirrings and started to notice some common themes emerging. And um, as we pulled on those threads, it really led to a more um, formal discernment process um, amongst the elders and the staff here and um, engaging the property committee as well to really start to identify what, um, what it might be that God's saying to our community and um, what things we needed to look out for and be aware of as uh, discovery moved into the future. Um, then about 12 months ago, we opened up that conversation more broadly amongst the discovery community as well through things like the prayer walks and opportunities to think about the future and, and ask God about what might he be doing, um, family conversations around property and the like as well. So it's definitely something that's been brewing for a while. And there's uh, an idea of uh, us being a community hub that's been flagged uh, in print and we've reflected on it as well. What's that about? Yeah, this is where it starts to get exciting and where some of those threads begin to pull together because we really noticed, um, you know, those themes of community and being open and not closed and um, not being a place that builds fences but somewhere that builds wells and, and can draw people. And so, you know, we started to imagine if this property and these buildings, whatever that would look like, could bless the community. Imagine if this property and these buildings could be something that is of benefit to the city that we've been called to. Imagine if this property and these buildings could facilitate relationships and conversation and engagement with people who feel like they're on the fringe or, and are on the fringe. Imagine if this property and these buildings could be... Um, alive and active and open seven days a week. And imagine if this property and these buildings could open up um, new discoveries for people and next steps towards the person of Jesus. That's pretty exciting. It's very, very exciting. Isn't that great, the potential of that? How do we reckon about that? Huh? Good? Yeah. Phil, um, there's a um, parable in the Gospels about um, sewing... Um, you don't patch old clothing with new cloth. Um, has that got some relevance as well for this context and for our building? And has there been some processes that have helped us understand that? Yes, um, I think probably three or four years ago now, beginning of middle of 2019, there was a, uh, as well as this discernment process that was going on, there were some professional reports we had completed, uh, one of which was a feasibility study on this building and also the, the uh, of the land as well. And that was done by a valuation consultant who gave us some good indication of what the building is worth, uh, but it also looked into the planning frameworks that were available through ER Ranges as far as what we could and couldn't do on the site. Uh, and so what it revealed to us was that there's actually not a lot we could do. We thought, okay, well, that, that was a bit disheartening. And so we saw all the things we couldn't do without really seeing the things we could do. Uh, but around about this time, um, 
we also had uh, the property committee appointed uh, by, by the elders after we had another report done, which was a 10-year capital expenditure report on how much it was going to cost to be in this building, as well as uh, repair it and do all the maintenance over the next 10 years. Uh, and that was the figure which Matt mentioned a little while ago, around 2.1 million. And so, and that was what we do know. There was around about three or four other reports that were recommended to be investigated, which we're still trying to discern and look into, which means we could actually end up spending a lot more money on this facility over the next 10 years. So, so that was probably where the conversation around, are we going to put new cloth onto the old garments? <laughs> or are we actually going to think, okay, what is maybe the, the bigger thing that God is calling us to here? Uh, should we be investing that kind of money elsewhere? And so... And so with, um, yeah, the third thing we had done was uh, an additional report off the back of that property committee meeting we had. We had a recommendation to appoint a town planning organization to really assess, uh, reassess the, the planning scheme under the, uh, the Yarra Rangers Council. And this is when we got a bit more excited because we realized there were options available to us to look at ways that we could bless our community with the land and with the spaces that we have. One of those is a community care accommodation, uh, so crisis care accommodation. Uh, we also things like cafe spaces, uh, outdoor recreation facilities, other places of worship, uh, and a mixture of those as well. Uh, there's some caveats of how we do that, but we really needed that input from the town planning organization to be able to really assess, okay, where's the Lord maybe calling us to? And so that was the end of last year. And then since then, we've been on this process of discernment with the prayer walks and things. Yep. There's lots of uh, strands all coming together, isn't there? But what we don't want to lose sight of uh, is our vision that every heart be found in Jesus' story and uh, our mission of discipling people towards their God-given uh, purpose and calling. How do those things, or how could those things, impact the shape and purpose of, of the potential of use of this site and buildings, etc.? Well, if you think about just, like, helping people discover their God-given identity and purpose, uh, you think about that and uh, thinking about our long-term aim in neighborhood, which is around restore relationships and transform communities, you can see the transformation and restoration is a really important part of what we were seeking to achieve as a church. And so it's the articulation of that and how we unpack that into the, the way that we create the spaces that is really important. In other words, we need to be creating spaces, I believe, if we're going to be really missional, that are going to help people connect on our site seven days a week, that are going to help people participate in shared interests, where people can express their gifts, where people can create independent relationships with one another for, who are going through similar life challenges, uh, particularly for people who are socially isolated in our community. And there are many who are socially isolated, because this is when transformation starts to happen. People start to connect with others who are going through similar life challenges. And when they're able to express their gifts, it creates a sense of purpose. It creates a sense of agency. And when people can connect like that, that's when people feel like they can contribute into the life of their community as well. And so that mission, I think, is really important to be front and center in everything that we're doing on the site here. I, um, I loved what Ben Kumar shared last mm. week, which uh, if you weren't here, I'd recommend listening to it. But he shared a really important, I think, prophetic gift into the life of our church, which really summarizes this point really well, is that maybe God is calling us as a church to put ministry back into the hands of everyday people. Whatever we're going to do on site here, it has to have that at the forefront as the priority of what we're doing. How can we seek to put ministry back into the hands of everyday people so that our mission is going to be outworked meaningfully? And so thinking of a community hub and the relocation of Discovery Community Care back on site, how is that all connected to that as well? Yeah, well, the Discovery Community Care, which is going to be relocated to the house, uh, hopefully by the end of the year, is, um, is going to be like a mini hub within the hub that we're seeking to create. Uh, we've already set it up so that it's going to be like a drop-in space for people to come throughout the week. Uh, we're going to have, um, you know, we've just installed a fireplace in, in the house, and that's going to be next to a lounge space with a dining area. There's going to be a, a movable kitchen bench, which we can use for cooking classes. In other words, we want people to feel like they can stay and connect and, and socialize with people in these hospitable environments. In other words, the space we've got there is going to serve our mission much more effectively than it had done in the past. There's even going to be a shower and washing facilities so people can put on a load of washing if they want as well. In other words, we want people to stay so that we can fulfill our mission of having really intentional relationships with people and so, so that we can actually grow in our discipleship so that but so other people can see what the kingdom is all about as well. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Thanks. Not just a feeling. That's great. 
uh, Beck, uh, uh, sir, should I say Exec Beck? You don't have to. Well, there are other, a, a couple of other names that were, I was prompted to use, but I chose not to, so we're going with that one. Uh, believing that God is already at work in the, in the neighbourhood, in the community, and we, we have that, that belief, and, and that our role is to join him in the work that he's already doing. Uh, could a community hub involve partnering with community groups or entities that are different but a, a bit alike us, um, and would that be exciting, or could it also be a bit risky? Mm, yeah, absolutely. So I think it goes to this idea that we've, we've heard a few times about community first and church second that really captures the heart by partnering with community groups, partnering with our council rather than these, uh, these bodies being seen as against us, particularly in a council space. You can easily get into a position where you think, oh, the council's against what we're trying to do. We want to really draw the council in, we want to draw in community groups and, and partner with them. And so I guess if you look at it from a threatening, uh, from a what could be the scary parts of that, it could be that you, you feel threatened if this is our turf and that's the perspective that we take, um, who's coming in on our turf and, and we can get very protectionist about it. And Beck mentioned it before about the idea of fences and wells, which if you're not familiar with that um, analogy, it just it's really talking about like really, really large properties where you can't possibly fence everywhere on that property. So the farmers will put in wells and drinking holes so that the livestock and animals are drawn to it rather than having the fences be the thing that... that makes the boundary, essentially. So we're talking about creating uh, these wells in our community so that that community can partner with us and how exciting would it be for us to be able to draw community in rather than put a fence around our property and say, no, this is our turf and uh, we're going to dictate what happens on our turf. And so it's risky, it's hard, it's messier it's, they're not straightforward conversations and not everyone's necessarily going to agree. But I think the, the benefit and the reward of having a, a well-based ministry here, it's, it's worth it, right? Because that's where the change and the transformation happens. And, um, uh, Exec Beck, um, we're talking about uh, conversations. Uh, what do you think? Is it better to be told what to do or to be a part of a conversation where together we might discern what God might be saying to us? Yeah, on the surface, that seems like a really obvious answer, right? It's, you know, people don't like to be told what to do necessarily. Um, but if you, you scratch, scratch that question a little bit further, um, sometimes it is just easier to be told. Um, this is the plan... This is how we're executing it. This is how you can be involved. You're in or you're out. That's kind of an easy way to go about it. Um, but it's also a, a way that tends to, um, forgive me for the analogy, but sort of you can take pot shots from the cheap seats if you're not invested in the solution, right? If you weren't consulted and you were just told what was happening, just it sets you up to be um, a critic potentially and you can just be like, oh, I don't agree with what's, what's happening over here and I don't know what's going on, so I'm just going to be critical. And so in a sense it is easier to be told what's going to happen, but the result I don't believe is anywhere near as rich and as lasting and as transformative as if we're brought into a discernment conversation because there's ownership, right? There's a lot of people who talk about, and my husband's one of them, talk about being here and putting the mud bricks in place. Like there's an ownership sense to that because there, people are invited into a process. And so absolutely that's, that's the more superior way to go in my opinion, but it's just, again, harder, messier, takes longer, um, but the results I think are going to be amazing. So what are some of the ways that um, we can get involved, uh, I say we collectively, can involved in conversations about the Legacy Project? Yeah, sure. So we've got this handy little, uh, hand, handy little handout <laughs> um, that the hosts will have. We've also got this online, so if anyone is enjoy, uh, wanting to access who's joining us online, 
this is there as well. And would really encourage you as a first port of call to, to look at this, read through it, look at the questions. What we'd love you to do is uh, invite your life group into this conversation because there are a couple of really great questions that are being posed in this. Have a conversation in your life group. Get the discussion going, get the question, even the questions back going, get the ideas going. We've got an email address that's also in this handout that if things start to stir and bubble up for you, you can reach out and let us know via that email address what, what you're discerning. We've also, in a couple of weeks' time, when we celebrate our 75th birthday, we're going to have a sort of bit of an expo style after the service and we're going to invite the kids to imagine and dream and be involved in this discernment process. We're going to invite you as a community to bring your ideas and your thoughts and, and spark the discussions. So all of those things are the ways that we can start getting underway and actually put legs on these ideas that we're starting to talk about. And uh, even with uh, Discovery Life via the prayer and praise points, even we could be introducing ideas and thoughts, uh, even as we're speaking today. Uh, and if you're at home, uh, you could certainly be doing that as well. So there's lots of ways for us all to be involved. So what do you see, um, Elder Beck? Elder Beck needs a microphone. She's got a good voice, but yeah. Elder Beck, what do you see uh, as, I love all these names, this is great. Um, what do you see as the value of this prayerful discernment and conversation phase? Uh, why, why should people really get involved? Mm. Well, like we've really talked about all morning, um, this isn't something that's just recently been dropped in the hearts of a couple of people. This is something that has really been stirring in this community for a long time. And this is a really exciting time that um, everybody from the very youngest to the most senior gets to be involved with, from those in this building today, online and listening later, and those out in the community as well. And we um, so strongly believe that each of you has God-given giftings and wisdom and passions that, um, and that there's a reason that many of you are here and, you know, that you're passionate about every heart being found in Jesus' story and about people being discipled towards their God-given purpose and calling. And so this is really an opportunity to be prayerful and um, asking God how he is calling you to be involved in this season. What is there that he's stirring within you? What whisperings are you hearing? What, um, what can you let us know about? Um, and we invite you to let us know about those things. And really, what we're inviting you to isn't to come along for the journey. We're inviting you to be part of it. And that's what we'd really love to see. And in a very real sense, then, the future... Is in the people. Is in the people. Uh, and uh, through the Spirit's uh, guidance and direction and, and loosening up of our minds and our hearts, uh, that that will become clear for us uh, over this journey. Uh, thanks so much, uh, panellists, um, uh, for your input and your stories. Um, it's been great. Let's uh, express our appreciation uh, for the input. <laughs> by the by, but not by the by at all, if someone nearby you stood in that earliest group of people today who were here at the time that this building was built, they contain an amazing number of stories. Before you go today, or maybe even take them over there for a coffee or buy them some chips or just listen to their story because it's very, very inspiring. Very inspiring. We're going to be moving into a time uh, of communion, the Lord's Supper, uh, in just a moment. And if you're at home online, uh, you might uh, choose to uh, be getting your elements ready uh, now. We're going to be uh, conducting communion just a little bit different than what we uh, usually do today. Um, we have a number of stations, as you would have seen as you came in uh, to the auditorium, uh, all around the building. Uh, and uh, there'll be an opportunity for you uh, in a moment or two to stand and to move to one of those stations and to receive... Um, to take up um, the emblems, the bread that represents the body of Jesus broken for you and uh, the grape juice uh, that represents the blood of Jesus that was shed for you. There's a number of options. There's real bread and there's crackers and there's COVID-friendly ones as well. Um, you'll have an opportunity to, to choose your own communion adventure. 
uh, as you move to uh, one of those stations. But before we go there, and before I ask these guys just for one more word each, what I'd like you to do in the spirit of our conversation today is just to turn to a person alongside of you or behind, of, behind you or in front of you if you're not too sure about the person next to you. What's one word for you that explains or expresses your appreciation for communion and Lord's Supper. Just a quick conversation, just a, not a sermon, an idea. Why do you value and appreciate communion or Lord's Supper? Just one with another. Always. We'll gather around. We'll gather around. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for those few words that were shared. Beck one, what's your word? Humbled. Redemption. Foundational. And mine uh, has a hyphen in it. open table let's pray gracious generous God we thank you for your gift of love and life and hope and mercy and redemption in your son Jesus his death his broken body his shed blood the sense of unity we have together as we gather around these tables this table a shared vision, a common mission. That in every time we, and in every time that we experience this, we proclaim your son's death and resurrection until he comes and we receive the benefits of that death and that resurrection as we eat and drink. Bless these moments to us now, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.